Hey everybody, welcome back to Photorec.tv. I'm Toby and today I'm talking to Sony photographers. Suddenly we've got so many choices for great zooms, for serious zooms. The Tamron 150 to 500 that I reviewed in Alaska earlier this summer and now the Sigma 150 to 600. I've been shooting with this lens for the past couple of weeks and I've got six things you need to know about it. Plus, I mean, I'm reviewing the lens, breaking it down into six nice neat little categories. And at the end of this video, I'm gonna give you my thoughts on all of the Sony Super Zooms currently on the market, well, the affordable ones. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Start at squarespace.com slash TV to save 10% off your first purchase. Let's start with some stats. This is a 150 to 600 F5 to 6.3 sport lens for Sony. It also comes in Leica L mount. The lens starts at f5 and as you zoom 173 is where it switches to f5.6 and then it switches to f6.3 right about 382 and stays there out to 600. The lens weighs 4.6 pounds. It's going to take 95 millimeter filter threads. Yeah, big ones. And it's going to cost you $14.99 which is just $100 more than the Tamron that I mentioned in the opening. Again, I'm going to talk about all the competitors at the end of this video. starting with the tripod collar. It does have an integrated Arca Swiss style foot. Yay, just like the Tamron, but there is something that's better about this than the Tamron or the Sony. It's got these lovely little catches at 90 degree increments. Ooh, could you hear that click? It's so satisfying. It's especially satisfying if you've carefully leveled your tripod head and then decide that you want a vertical shot. So you're shooting like this, boom, you know that you have a perfect level shot again. It's the little things. It makes a difference. Now the collar itself is not removable, but the foot is, does require some tools, but it's just a moment. And then under here is a quarter inch hole. So if you are anti Arca Swiss, also known as Manfrotto, you could screw in a Manfrotto plate and then you'd be happy. You also have little strap holes on this collar and Sigma does provide a strap. Now on the side, you've got your typical autofocus, manual focus switch, focus limiter, stabilization modes, one or two, two for panning, one is standard. And then you've got this little custom switch down here. As it was described to me, you can change how aggressive the stabilization is through the viewfinder. There's not supposed to be an actual effect on the shot itself. So you say, why do you want that? Well, it actually can encourage you, if you put it in C2, there really is no stabilization through the viewfinder, only once you take the picture. It shows you how shaky you are and can encourage you to kind of brace up. However, I saw a huge difference in using these modes in the video section. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the video section. Now, if you are buying this lens for the L mount, like a mount system, you can use the included, no, it's not included. You can use the Sigma USB dock to further customize that custom switch. You got one more switch on the side here. This is for zoom friction or torque as some people are calling it. You can set it to lock only at 150 millimeters though. So it only locks at the wide end. That's unlike the clutch lock system that I really liked on the Tamron. You could lock it at any focal length. Then you can also switch it. Then you can also, you can switch it to tight, T for tight. What does that do? Well, uh, makes me grunt when I zoom. There's a lot more friction to the zoom ring. And then finally there's S for smooth. No grunting required. It's in the other direction. And now it, zooms very quickly using this focus ring. You can also push pull. So yes, it's not an internal design that we'll talk more about in a minute, but it does have that benefit of being able to very quickly zoom in and zoom out. You also have three customizable buttons on the lens. Now there are three of them, but you can only assign the same function to all three. That's no different than any other lenses. No drawback. I'm just making sure you know. And then out at the end, you might have noticed this very nice lens hood that has a slightly different attachment than you might be used to. It's a screw lock system. So this just gets tightened or loosened to put on or off. It feels very nice. Now it does feel a little bit slower than your typical kind of twist lock, 
but there, I did it just now. About 30% of the time, and I'm sure I've made up that statistic, I get jammed up. And then I have to undo it and redo it, making sure I've lined it all up and in the field in a hurry. It's been more than a couple of times where I don't always get it lined up. So when you account for that, this system that feels unjammable feels nice. I will say though, if you are a fan of 95 millimeter CPL filters, you don't get a little door in here that will allow you to adjust or would allow you to pretend like your lens can talk. Now, Sigma does include a lens cap and they also include this very nice soft cover that can go on either way. So it can act as a lens cap or a lens hood cover. It all feels very high quality. My usual subject for focus testing is my dog Archer running straight at me. He is fast and I think this is a good test. I saw very good autofocus from this lens. Even shooting wide open, the keeper rate was high. Now I've done this test with a Tamron 150 to 500, my Sony 100 to 400, the Sony 200 to 600, and I didn't see any real issues here. I've got no concerns recommending this lens to action photographers looking for a lot of reach on a tight budget. I will point out though that if you're in the Sony A9 or A1 system, you're only going to get 15 frames per second with autofocus. This is true of third-party lenses. I mean, if you're buying an A9 or an A1, you really want to spend the money to get a Sony lens so that you're able to use the camera to its full advantage. But consider, just consider this scenario. Maybe right now you got an A7 III, but you're starting to get serious about sports. In a few years, you pick up a used A9 or a used A1. So if you're headed in that direction, you are going to limit yourself in the future. But there is also another native versus non-native lens difference that I found that I'll talk about in just a moment. It's at the wide end that you actually have great macro focusing. Now, the 100 to 400 is even a little bit better but you're out at 400 millimeters. So just keep that in mind. You can get really good, almost the same as the 100 to 400, at 150, but you do get best results by switching to manual focus. And it's important to note that these two lenses are class leading and almost providing true macro in a telephoto. All of the rest of them aren't terrible, but not nearly as close as these lenses. I'm not sure that a lot of people buy these longer lenses to use for video, but a couple of quick things that I noticed. One, this has a stepper motor in it, which provides very nice, smooth, and quiet autofocus system. I mentioned in the Tamron review that I saw some jittery stabilization at times. I haven't seen that with the Sigma, but as I mentioned earlier on, make sure you're on C1 because it does make a big difference in video stabilization. And now here's the other native versus non-native lens issue I found. With the Sony A1, you've got two versions of in-camera stabilization, normal and active. Active being a little bit smoother for a little bit more shaky or movements. With third-party lenses, you are locked out of active stabilization. Now, Sony states that they use digital stabilization in-camera in conjunction with lens stabilization to further stabilize. So that's one way that Sony says, hey, if you're buying our cameras, you should buy our lenses. All right, so as I was editing this video, I thought, hey, it'd be a good idea to show that active versus normal stabilization menu option and the fact that it's grayed out. And so I recorded the back of the camera with the Sigma attached, and uh, it wasn't grayed out this time. It allowed me to move into active stabilization. I thought, crap, everything I just said in this segment is now wrong. So I went out. And I took some more handheld footage in active stabilization mode, both in custom one and custom two, C1, C2 on that switch, and neither of them actually act like it's stabilized. So there's a bug here, clearly. Avoid active stabilization if it's even available to you. Stay in normal stabilization, stay on C1 if you want the smoothest handheld shots. I really don't know who to blame for this bug, but it is something that's going to happen sometimes with third-party lens manufacturers. All right, let's talk about quality. The lens I had on hand to compare against is the Sony 100 to 400. And actually, when Sigma sent this to me, they said, this might not represent final production quality. But 
I found it to be very sharp and very similar to the Tamron 150 to 500, which, you know, in the center between the two of them, very, very similar. Out in the corners, this lens is a little bit softer, nothing dramatic. So like autofocus, I didn't really have any concerns. Now, that might seem like the opposite of a compliment. I don't have concerns. But I'll tell you what, when you are comparing this lens versus a lens that cost $1,000 more and actually offers a little bit less range, well, I think it's pretty impressive that you have to look very carefully and really only see a noticeable difference in the corners. I did see another reviewer complaining about bokeh. Bokeh, I don't know. I think they look incredibly similar. Maybe the 100 to 400 is a little bit smoother, but again, the difference is slight. I'm not seeing any issues, nothing that would be distracting at all all, but we do have some other issues to discuss. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. I personally moved to Squarespace a few years ago for Photorec.tv and my own personal portfolio. I am so happy with this decision. Their automated tools made it really easy to move my site to Squarespace, and now I'm on a platform that looks beautiful, it's easy to add content to, and secure. Now, many of you watching this are photographers. Squarespace provides photographers beautiful portfolio and gallery pages. All you need to do is pick a template and drag and drop. It really is that easy. But if for any reason you get stuck, they provide 24-7 customer support. If you want to sell your work, the integrated e-commerce system is incredibly simple to set up. They also offer an online booking tool, email campaign tool, and analytics so you can track who's visiting and why. It truly is a fantastic all-in-one platform. You can try Squarespace for free for 14 days, no credit card required, Start at squarespace.com slash photorectv to save 10% off your first purchase. So we already touched on the fact that the A9 and A1 users aren't going to get the fastest frames per second with autofocus with this lens. Uh, I also mentioned that it's not an internal zoom. Uh, so as you zoom in or zoom out, you are pumping some air through here and could build up a little bit more dust. But the upside is you now have a much more compact lens for travel. Another downside, no teleconverters except on the L-mount system. So with Sony, it actually does mount. I tried it, but the lens is completely dead. Manual focus doesn't even work, so poop. All right, but let's take a moment and talk about each of our kind of telephoto lenses in that realm of affordability and some thoughts that might help you decide which one's best for you. Let's start with the Sony 100 to 400. This is an f4.5 to 5.6 lens. Right now on sale at the time of making this video at 2400, usually sits about 2500. It weighs just over three pounds, eight inches long, and it does work for teleconverters for more reach. Now here's what I'll say about this lens. Buy it if you value portability and also that close focusing option. Plus the fact that 100 millimeters, well, it might seem stupid to say, but it's wider than 150. Now, these lenses can be used for portrait lenses, but because we can start at 100 I, and f4.5, I really find this to be a quite lovely portrait lens, which makes it even more valuable as a travel lens for me. I really, really enjoy the portability and the fact that this is the lens I can bring along to make lovely portraits of people as I travel. Next, let's talk about the Sony 200 to 600. That comes in at two grand. It weighs 4.6 pounds and it's over 12 and a half inches long. It is an impressive lens. Many of my Sony friends that spend time shooting birds and wildlife, they love the lens. They get great results with it and they get great results when paired with teleconverters, which gives you some fantastic reach at a fairly reasonable price. But it is big. And it is heavy, and not only is it heavy, but I find it to be kind of front heavy, not very comfortable to hand hold. It's certainly a lens that you're going to want to use on a gimbal. So just something to keep in mind. Then there's the Tamron 150 to 500 F5 to 67 lens that I've referenced a couple of times in this video. It costs $13.99. It weighs 3.8 pounds, 8.2 inches long. You know, I really enjoyed using the Tamron on the Wild Alaska workshop. I really didn't have many complaints about it. I thought it was a great value lens, but now that this Sigma has come along, I struggle to really say that it's a lens you should buy over the Sigma. You could say that it gets you almost a 600 and it's 20% lighter. So if you're on a budget and you really want to go with a light, longer lens, 
that's where you end up with the Tamron 150 to 500. And then of course we've got the Sigma 150 to 600. This lens that I've been talking about, f5 to 63 again, 1499, 4.6 pounds, 10.4 inches long. I think the summary is a great feature set at a very compelling price. It is getting bigger, it is getting a little heavier, but it's got great build quality, and I saw it provide great image quality all the way out to 600 millimeters. Hard to argue with that. Now, there is one more lens that I want to put on this list. It's the Sigma 100 to 400 f5 to 6.3, just 949, but I think you should add the cost of a collar, which isn't included. That's another 130, bringing this price up to 1080. It weighs just two and a half pounds and it is just 7.7 .7 inches long. It's by far the lightest and smallest zoom lens in this group. Image quality is still very good, but I do start to see some autofocus differences between this lens and the others. It's not as fast. You also have that slightly slower max aperture at f6.3. So I'm a little more reluctant to recommend this for wildlife and action, but I love using telephotos for landscape. And in that category, this lens does just Here's what I'll say about zoom. It rarely feels like enough, unless you pay a lot of money to go on really incredible workshops with awesome guides that get you really close to wildlife, 400 millimeters never feels close enough. The Sigma getting you 600 millimeters at just $1,500 makes it a compelling lens. But I'd love you to look over this list, tell me which one you've picked or which one you plan to pick. Sometimes your comments are more helpful to those watching these videos than anything I've said. So please, share your knowledge, share your opinions, and don't forget to hit that thumbs up button along with pressing subscribe and that little bell so you'll be notified of future videos. Links to buy all of these lenses are down below this video. Your use of those links greatly helps what I do on this channel. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.